Just a quick announcement before we start. I was out just grabbing some water from the car and there was a dog that I heard all morning and, and then I saw him. Okay, we are in Romans chapter 8. We're actually in part 3 of a series on prayer. The last time I was here, which was not last Sabbath, but the Sabbath before that, we began the series. And we talked in that Sabbath about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, and the title of that presentation, does anyone remember what it was called? Angry Prayers. Angry Prayers. And it seemed as though that was an oxymoron, you know, angry prayers. Prayers are supposed to be nice and flowery and positive and uplifting, and then we have angry prayers. And yet Ephesians 4.26 indicates that God wants us to be angry and not sin, which seems to be an oxymoron and opposite. But the, the context of it is, as we learn from the Old Testament experience of David, Isaiah 59, excuse me, Psalm 59 is, is that there are things happening in this world that God wants us to be angry about. There are things happening in this world that God is angry about. And when we have a heart like God's, when we have a heart like David's, who had a heart after God's own heart, we will be angry about the things that God is angry about. And also we learn that sometimes there's not a lot we can do about those things that we get angry about except give them to God. And it will be helpful for us to learn how to do that because when we learn to give our anger to God, He can displace it, He can take it, and in its place He can put in peace and joy and love. And when we stuff our anger, a lot of times it'll come out. And we see all of this taking place in the world today with uh, road rage and air rage, and we talked about that, and rap rage, and all of those other manifestations of anger that sometimes comes from way back when we were young and we went through experiences that we weren't able to deal with and weren't able to, to get out and to communicate to others. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that this morning. I love this verse because of all the verses in the Bible, I have to say that this verse, and I really appreciated, uh, Bella, the way the verse, the translation you read there, this verse of all the verses in the Bible tells me that God has a heart. This is talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. And it's talking about how that the Holy Spirit helps us with our weaknesses, our inability to pray. A lot of us, some of us, a few of us, one or two of us, may struggle with how to pray. And I never knew how to pray when I was a kid. I always said my prayers every night. But I just said, in our Father, and a Hail Mary, and God bless the world, basically. And... The disciples struggled with knowing how to pray. They, they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And one of those is recorded, one of those, those times that they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray is recorded in Luke chapter 11. And Jesus gave them an outline of prayer, which to us seems very simple and very basic, but it is significant because there are times when, when we don't know what to do with the evil that is taking place on planet Earth. And Jesus reminds us in that prayer in Luke that there's a lot of things happening on planet Earth that are not my will. It's not God's intention that this planet ever suffer evil. He never intended it. He never created it to, to experience evil. And so we should pray that God will deliver us from evil. Amen. And God wants to deliver us from evil. God does not intend that we would experience evil. That's not God's plan for us. He wants to deliver us from it. And so in this context, though, there are times when we're trying to think of what we should pray for, and we don't know what we should pray for, and so what God says is He reads our hearts. The Holy Spirit will read our heart, and the Holy Spirit will actually give utterance to the very things that we can't utter. The Holy Spirit will actually translate our thoughts and our feelings into words and present them to God. When James says that he is sick and tired of X, Y, and Z, what he really means is, what he really means is, is he's just longing for heaven and he's longing for this, this world and this sin and this pain and this evil just to come to an end. That's what he's really saying. He's not upset with people in general or friends in particular. <laughs> he's just struggling with this world and it's selfishness, and it's evil, and it's pain, and it's heartache. That's what the Holy Spirit does for me when I pray. 
translates my feelings and my words and my struggles into verbal communication that tells God what my heart feels. And, and God looks at me and he says, you know, I feel the same way. I'm struggling too. I'm really, I'm really done with all of this. This word here in, and I'm just going to read the verse again, it's Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weaknesses, for we don't know how we should pray as we ought to, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now that word groaning means to voice a deep, inarticulate sound as of pain and grief or displeasure. That's the dictionary definition of groanings. And again, this verse tells me that God has a heart. This morning we're going to look at this word as it is used in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament. And we're going to discover that this word is very closely connected to something that is meaningful to God and therefore will be very meaningful to us in our Christian experience when it comes to prayer. So we're going to look at a couple of verses in the Bible where this word is used. There aren't a lot of them in the New Testament, connect that to the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at a couple of examples of prayer that I believe will really be an encouragement to us this morning. So as we do that, let's just open again. I'd like to, to pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you this morning for this opportunity to open your word. I know that we are here with our weaknesses, with our infirmities, with our struggles, with our unutterable words that testify of our experience, of our heart, of those things that have deeply troubled us and hurt us in this world. And those often come in the form of people. People that we know, some that we don't know, that have intersected and interacted in our lives. Many times in a very negative way. Sometimes in such a positive way that their loss is being felt. And Father, we long to be able to communicate how we feel and how sin has affected us and infected us and to get all of this off our chest. But there are moments when we don't know what to say, we don't know how to communicate. And we're praying this morning that you will fulfill your promise, that you will send your Holy Spirit to communicate to us and to put words to our feelings so that you can work powerfully in our lives and bring us the hope, that, the joy, the peace that we need. Father, I pray for each person in this congregation and myself. Speak to us now through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the verses, there aren't a lot of them. There are just a couple of them in the New Testament. And then there are a couple more in the Old Testament. Actually, there's quite a few in the Old Testament, but one in particular that I want us to look at because it is recorded in the New Testament. The first one is found in John chapter 11 and verse 38. Now, in this story, in this particular story, Jesus has, if you just like to open your Bibles there, Jesus has the opportunity to perform a miracle in the raising of Lazarus. And he is there after Lazarus has died and been dead for four days. He is there at the tomb of Lazarus. And surrounding him are people that are filled with unbelief. People that are filled with, with feelings that are judgmental and critical and negative. They're wondering about Jesus. They're wondering why he hasn't raised Lazarus. They're wondering why, excuse me, he let Lazarus die. They're wondering if he can even raise him and why he would. And they're ready really to plot Christ's death. They're enemies, not only of Jesus, but even of Lazarus. And yet they're pretending to be friends. They're pretending to be, to be sorry that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus reads their hearts. He sees all of this. And he feels the weight of all of this unbelief and all of this uh, hypocrisy. And so in John chapter 11 and verse 38, it describes his feelings. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, came to the grave, and it was in a cave, and a stone was laid upon it. Now the context of this, of course... I think is, is powerful because verse 35 is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He feels the way we feel. He, he wrestles with our emotions. He struggles with death. He never intended for it to come upon us. This morning I was reading a tweet from a young man who was a, a RISE graduate 
and he lives in Norway, and he said, the, the tweet said, that the day of death's death is soon approaching. The day of death's death. God is looking forward to that day. That's a day when he's going to resurrect his people in, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, fast. God hates death. Death is his enemy. And Jesus reveals that heart as he's at the graveside of Lazarus. He reveals this groaning, this deep emotion. Now, this emotion is also expressed in Acts chapter 7. In fact, these two verses along with Romans are the only three verses in the Old New Testament where this word is used. Acts chapter 7 is a place historically in the experience of God's people where Stephen is recounting the Old Testament history of God's people. And it's in verse 34 that Stephen talks about the slavery that was taking place in Egypt. And he says in that context, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt and I have heard their groanings and I have come down to deliver them and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. So Stephen here is recounting the history of God's people in Egypt and how God has seen their groanings. That's the word that is used here. The same one that's used in John eleven thirty eight. The same one that's used in Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, 26. I've seen their groanings, God says. And now I'm going to send you, Moses. Stephen's recounting the history. I'm going to send you to do something about that. Now I think it's significant because... In the Old Testament, God continually sees the groanings of His people and sends His ambassadors, His messengers, His people to do something about it. In the New Testament, God sees our groanings and He sends His own Son to do something about it. Jesus Christ Himself comes. And in Christ's absence, God feels and experiences our groanings and He sends the Holy Spirit to help us. In other words, God is feeling, feeling, feeling all of this. Old Testament, New Testament, and beyond. God is working, working, working in our behalf to do something about these emotions and these feelings that, that we have because of evil and pain and suffering and loss. God has a heart. God is not some indefinite essence that's floating around somewhere. He's not a statue. God is, is flesh and blood, not necessarily like we are. He's spirit. So let me, let me restate that. Let me rephrase that. God is a being, a personal being with emotions and feelings. We were made in His image. And the emotions and the feelings that we have indicate that those are like God. God has emotions and feelings. And it's not wrong to have emotions and feelings. And we sometimes stifle those emotions and we stifle those feelings and we harden our hearts and we back up and we try to pretend that we're okay and we have that stiff upper lip. Because we think that's the way we ought to be. But God, God expresses emotion and feeling over and over again. Look at this verse with me, for example, in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 11. God here, and I'm just going to give you the background of this because I think it's powerful. God here is talking about the struggle he's having with his backslidden people. And in the context of that, he's talking about it in relation to Sodom and Gomorrah and what he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. Finally came to a place where there was nothing more he could do, and so he gave them up. And, and in Hosea, he's wrestling with his people, and he's, he's voicing these feelings that he has. Verse 8 of Hosea chapter 11. By the way, Hosea is right next to Daniel. And just a few chapters, it's hard to find, I know it is, but because uh, Daniel's hard to find too, isn't it? <laughs> Minor prophets, right after Daniel, right before Matthew, about three or four chapters. Hosea 11, verse 8, How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zoboam? These are two of the cities that were in the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. How can, I, how can I leave you? How can I give you up like I gave them up? How could I do that? He says, 
my heart is turned within me. My, my repentance are kindled together. I will not execute, verse 9, the, the fierceness of my anger. I will, not, I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. I will not enter into the city. I am God and not man. You know, I think sometimes we see God as we see ourselves. And we forget that God is not like us. God's compassion and God's mercy goes far beyond what we can even imagine. And there are times, like, for example, when we see the angels going to Sodom and Gomorrah to check it out. And Abraham is, as it were, trying to convince them, well, if there are 40, if there are 35, if there are 30, if there are 20, if there are 10, Lord, you wouldn't destroy it if there were 10 people there, would you? And sometimes we, get the conclu- we come to the conclusion, we get the idea from the Scripture that, that people are more merciful than God. Do you know what God was thinking the whole time that Abraham was pleading with him? God was thinking, yes, Abraham, you're right, I wouldn't do it for 35. If there's 35 there, I won't do it. Keep going. Because God is inspiring Abraham. It's not the other way around. Keep going, Abraham. 30? Abraham's scared. Keep going, Abraham. 20? Keep going, Abraham. 10? Keep going, Abraham. I I, I can't. God could have. God could have saved it for one. God sent his son to this earth for one. God, Jesus Christ, would have died in Calvary for one person. Just one. He would have given his life for one. That's the heart of God. We think about Moses, you know, Moses is, is there on the mount, you know, and the people are, are, are circling the, the calf. They're, they're in apostasy and they're worshiping the calf while Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments. And Moses comes down and Joshua and they hear this sound and they think it's the battle of war. And Moses says, no, they're having a party. And they're, they're worshiping an idol. And, and as God is talking to Moses about this apostasy, God tells him, he says, I want you to separate from the camp of Israel. I'm going to destroy them, and I want to make a, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Moses. And what does Moses say? Don't do it! And sometimes we get the idea, well, Moses was much more merciful, long-suffering than God was. No. God was inspiring Moses to say that. God was the reason why Moses even indicated anything like that in his language. Don't do it. No, Moses never would have said that if it wasn't for God's inspiration. And God was so proud of him for saying that. In fact, God was actually testing Moses' faith to see if he really loved this people that God really loved. And nobly, endure, nobly did Moses endure that test. God is happy with us when we hurt because of pain and sin and suffering. We ought to hurt because of that. We ought to, as we study, be angry about it. And we, at times, ought to be able to come to God without being able to say a single word. It's difficult, isn't it? It's hard. Jonah, excuse me, Job had a hard time with it. Let's look there in Job chapter 1. We see Job, you know, he's such a powerful illustration of faithfulness and righteousness. And, and we, we sometimes look at his experience and we don't realize that Job had his struggles. Job really struggled at times with this whole idea of God's goodness and God's love. The book of Job opens up with this picture of a perfect man. There's a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and he was perfect. He was one that eschewed evil and feared God. And this perfection is, if you will, demonstrated. Sometimes, you know, we argue about perfection and we, we, we struggle with it and we think, you know, we can be perfect. No, we can't. Yes, we can. No, we can't. We're having these theological debates about perfection. <laughs> and, and we don't always look at what the Bible is talking about when it, when it bi- gives a picture of perfection. What does perfection look like in a human being? What does humanity look like when God calls them perfect? So we look at the story of Job. And in the story of Job, we find a man who is a father. He's a wealthy man. He's one of the wealthiest man, men in the East at this time, but he's a father. He's a father of how many children? Ten. Ten. I've got two. <laughs> he's got ten. Seven boys and three girls. And he's worried about them. Can you relate to that, parents? 
Can you relate to that, grandparents? He's worried about his kids. And so what does he do? Well, they have these opportunities when they get together and they, they party together, and he's worried that they're maybe cursing God, and maybe they're not as close to God as they ought to be or should be, or he wants them to be. You know how we are, parents. We want our kids to be really close to God, right? We want them to do all the things we didn't do and make none of the mistakes we made. And so he prays. He gets up early in the morning, and he offers sacrifices for his kids, and he prays for his kids. And this is what Job did continually. He's continually praying for his kids, not because they're good kids, but because he's afraid they're not. He's sacrificing his time and his stuff for his kids because he's afraid they're not what they should be. That's perfection. That's what perfection looks like. Perfection is the ability to be merciful to imperfect people. Perfection is the ability to be merciful to imperfect people. That's why in Luke's accounts of the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't end with the phrase that Matthew ends with, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He ends with another phrase. You know what the phrase he ends with is? Matthew 6.36, be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Perfection is being merciful to the imperfect, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. This is what Job is doing. He's praying for his kids who aren't quite up to the standard not quite where they should be. At least that's what he's thinking. And of course, Satan hates this. You know, Satan hates it when we pray. You realize that. He hates prayer. Why does he hate prayer? Because he knows that when we pray, he's going to suffer loss. He's going to lose something when we pray. When we pray for people, Satan's going to lose something. There's a reference I want you to memorize. It's not hard to memorize. All you need to remember is the first five numbers of our numerical system. One, two, three, four, five. Can you remember those numbers? And then just turn the two into a T. One T, three, four, five. One T, page 345. And that statement is about prayer. This is what it says. I'm going to read it to you really quickly. I thought I would just give it to you from memory, but at 52 years of old, of age, <laughs> my memory's not what it used to be. And if you're not that old yet, you'll get there. And if you are that old, you can certainly relate to what I'm saying. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, T, three, forty, five. One, T, three, forty, five. Testimonies to the church is what T stands for. I'm sorry. T stands for testimonies to the church. So it's volume one of the testimonies to the church. If Satan sees that he is in danger of losing one soul... He will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears that he will lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light might not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres, and in his helplessness, he casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ. Our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. Amen. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever experienced that? You know, that darkness? That presence? The, the, the efforts of Satan and the evil angels to, to keep us in darkness and, and keep us and separate us from God? Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appeal to, Jesus. For he fears and he trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. He continues to call legions of evil angels to accomplish the, his object. But when angels, all powerful and clothed with the armory of heaven, come to the help of the fainting pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back, knowing that the battle is lost. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So Satan's upset at Job because this man is perfect. What does this perfection look like? He prays. Who does he pray for? 
Well, people that he's worried about. People that don't seem to be living up to all the light. People that, that don't seem to be at the place that he's thinking they should be at. People that have fallen short. People that he's worried about. People that may be cursing God in their hearts. People that have obvious sins, flaws, imperfections in their character. That's who Job is praying for. They happen to be his kids. And Satan doesn't like it. So Satan steps in and Satan seeks to destroy Job. God doesn't let him do that, but he is allowed to take all of Job's livestock, all of Job's children, and then afflict Job's health. There's some parallels here that are really powerful because when you parallel the book of Job to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we're going to go through a similar experience in the end of time. We're going to lose all of our ability to buy and sell, all of our livestock, all of our economic prosperity. Job lost it all. And our health. Our physical bodies are going to be afflicted. We're going to go through a struggle. In fact, there's going to be a death decree, it says, in Revelation chapter 13, against those who are faithfully following the Lamb wherever He goes. And in that time, we can say by faith with Job, and I'll just read the verse right here for you, and this one is found in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2, verse 10. Job's wife has just come to him and said, you know, you've lost everything, your kids, your economic wealth, your health, everything's gone, just curse God and die. And Job says to her, verse 10, you're speaking like one of the foolish women speaks. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And that was the end of the story. Right? No, that's just the beginning. <laughs> the wife, like many of our wives and the females among us, was very quick to express emotion. The women are more inclined to be emotional than men are. And this is exactly what Job's wife did. She expressed her emotion. I mean, what would you do, ladies, if you just lost all your children in one day? How would you feel? So Job is like, he's very British, you know? He's very proper and very British and very stiff upper lip. Don't be silly, honey. <laughs> Just because we lost our 10 kids doesn't mean you need to go all emotional on us. Let, let's just keep it cool. God is good. That's Job in the face of his wife's emotion. But just a few verses later, Job loses it. That's the way it is with guys. It just takes us a little bit longer. I remember when my father died, my wife was just a basket case. Completely lost it. And I was like, it's okay, honey. We knew this was coming. Cancer. It took a while. I mean, you know, we just, we knew. And then a few weeks later, I couldn't even get out of bed. I was in bed for days. I couldn't get out of bed. I was just devastated. And that's, that's just the difference in our natures. Job goes through the same experience and even worse. And possibly because he stifles rather than emotes initially. His friends come to talk with him, you know, and, and uh, I should say talk with him. They come to, to uh, console him, to comfort him. And the best they could do was to be quiet for seven days. That was, that was good stuff right there. Seriously. They were just with him. Just sat there for seven days. But then they started talking. They started talking about all that theology they learned at Andrews, you know, at seminary. <laughs> and they started communicating to Job. And it didn't go well. Because Job was in a situation here, and you can read about it right here in Job chapter 3. I'm going to read the verse for you. Just, just jump down here to Job chapter 3 and look here in verse 12. Well, let me just find it in my Bible. First of all, Job curses the day that he dies. Verse three, verse chapter 3, verse 1. And after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day that he died. And he said, let, it, let the day perish, verse 3, in, in which it was said that I was born, and the night when, in which it was said there was a man-child conceived. And then he goes on and he expresses his angst, his struggles, 
And he even says in verse 25, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but as a father, I struggle on a regular basis. I won't say daily, but it's definitely weekly. With ideas and thoughts of what might happen to my kids. They just come to me and I just have to say, Lord, please preserve my son. Please preserve my daughter. Not because they're bad kids, but because we live in an evil world. And sometimes our kids make decisions and choices not near as bad as the ones I made, but that take them in a direction I'm just thinking, ah, it's 2 o'clock in the morning and my son's not home yet. Where is the guy? <laughs> oh. It's, and this is what Job is saying. He's not saying, I knew this was going to happen in the sense that I knew it was going to happen. He's just saying, I had these things that I was afraid of. I was praying about for my kids. I was struggling with this. And now it's happened. Now these things have come upon me. And you know, it's, it's really sad how this goes on because Job is spilling out his heart. He's talking about his anguish. He's talking about all of the the difficulties that he had. He says, for example, in verse 24, my sighing comes before I eat and my groanings pour out like water. And that's that key word again, the groanings. And his friends, as they start talking to him, they say, well, Job, um, if your sons were sinning against God, then he cast them away because of their transgressions. That's the best they could do. Your sons, you know, you were praying for them and you were cur- worried about them cursing God in their hearts and so if that happened, then God just kind of killed them. And Job is thinking about this, you know, and, and of course he understands what they were taught at seminary. He understands that this is the way that the theology of the day was communicated, that if you do good, God will bless you, and if you don't do good, God's going to curse you. And so if the curse comes, that's because you weren't doing good. And so if your kids died, then obviously they weren't doing good. But now Job is in a completely different situation. He's not in a classroom writing down theological concepts. He's in life experiencing the loss of his kids. And he has a completely different understanding than what he got in the classroom. And his understanding is this. Wait a minute, he says to his friends. I'm just giving you the short story. I didn't... Not, there was nothing that changed between me and God. There's nothing different that happened today than happened the week before last or is going to happen tomorrow. So... For all this stuff to happen to me, for you to say, well, you're sinning and your kids are sinning and all this. No, I I wasn't actually. I mean, if if God was going to curse me and take all my stuff away, he might as well have done it a year ago or two years ago because my experience with him has just been consistent. God chose a perfect man to undo an imperfect theology about him. God chose Job chose Job to communicate to us something about himself that was misunderstood in Job's time, in Christ's time, and perhaps in our time. And the best way for me to relate this to you is just to tell you a story of an experience I had when I traveled to Africa. It was December. It was Christmas time. It's the only time I've been away from my family, and they've never let me forget this. I was going to a youth congress in Botswana. I traveled through London because that's where my mother lives and I was visiting her. This was in 2005, 6, 7, I can't remember the exact year, 6 or 7. And when I got to London and I spent a few days with my mother and then I prepared to leave for Botswana, I was flying from London to Frankfurt and from Frankfurt into, um, I'm trying to think now, I was going to say Joburg, yeah, Joburg. And then to Gabor, G-A-B-O-R, it's in my brain, but I can't say the word. Anyway, the capital of Botswana. I got, I drove to Heathrow Airport. I was getting a ride to to the airport. I got to Heathrow Airport. It was cold, but I wasn't even thinking about anything like weather. Got to Heathrow Airport, and when I got there, the airport was packed with people. Packed with people. I thought, this is unusual. I mean, London Heathrow Airport is very busy, but this was unusual. And when I went to the ticket 
Lufthansa Airlines, German Airlines, when I went to the ticket area, there were just people, three or four people back all the way across. I couldn't even get in there. And I'm, so I'm listening to these people and they're talking. And some of them are talking in German. Some of them are talking in English. And they're saying, yeah, when was your flight canceled? Oh, my flight was canceled two days ago. And I've been waiting for two days. And my flight was canceled yesterday. And yeah, my flight was canceled. And I looked up on the board. And there's all these flights. Cancel, 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 cancel. Delay, 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 delay. I'm thinking, whoa, the weather. And this airline gal comes up to the front. And she calls out a flight. And it's my flight. And then she says, only flight, I'm just going to say 5405. Only flight 5405, please. Everyone's moving forward. And I'm trying to get up there. And I'm saying, yeah, are you on that flight? I'm on that flight. And so she checks me in. And people are saying, what about, can I get on that flight? Is that book? What are, I'm saying, I'm thinking, wow. So I get on the flight. I or check in. I go to where you're supposed to wait. There's no seats. It's just packed out. The whole airport is packed out with people. And I prepare, you know, I'm just waiting for this flight, and it's delayed, it's delayed, and then finally I get on the flight, and the flight takes off. And when I land in Frankfurt, I'm looking at the news about London Heathrow. And what I find out is that my plane was the last plane to leave London Heathrow. That after I left, the airport was closed down officially, and 40,000 people were stranded over Christmas in London Heathrow Airport. 40,000 people. They had makeshift tents that they put up outside London to, to put these people in. It was just unbelievable. And I made it out. I'm like, this is, this is very unusual. This is providence. There's something's going on here. So I get to my destination. I'm doing meetings with these young people. And I'm preaching and preaching. And I'm listening to others. It's so hot in Botswana that all of our meetings are in the morning and in the evening. There's no meetings in the afternoon. So we have three meetings in the morning, three meetings in the evening, just back to back. And so through the afternoon, we're doing counseling with the young people there. And there was this one young lady that came to this counseling session, and I was counseling with her. And she had missed the first opportunity, and because she was suffering migraine headaches and she couldn't get out in the sunshine, it was too hard for her. If you've ever had a migraine, you know what I'm talking about. And so she came later that evening, that day. And she started talking with me, and the first thing she told me was she was suicidal. And I said, oh, well, we really need to get you connected with some counsel. And she says, no, it's okay. She says, I've tried to kill myself several times, three times. She tried to kill herself. She's been through the cycle, been through the cycle, been through the cycle. She's just communicating this to me. She's just telling me. I said, okay, what's up? And she said, well, she said, when I was a young girl, my uncle, who is part of our church, rape me. And she said, ever since that time, I've just really, really struggled. And I just have been suicidal. I've had migraine headaches. Um, she's just had a number of issues that she's gone through. And I said, I said, I'm really sorry. I said, we just need to really pray about this and work through this. I said, um, who have you counseled with? Who have you talked to about this? And she said, nobody. I said, well, what do you mean? Have you, I said, have you talked to your parents about it? Never. This was years ago. She was like eight or nine years old. Now she's a, she's a young lady. She's never talked to her parents about this. I said, well, have you talked to the pastor about it? No, I've never talked to the pastor about it. I said, you haven't talked to anyone about it? She said, no. I said, well, have you talked to God about it? And she said, why would I talk to God about it? He's the one who did this. It happened because of him. And I said, what, what do you mean? And she said, everything that happens in our lives is God's will. And I said, whoa. I said, now, you got to understand, that's what was communicated to her in one of the meetings that I sat in at that Youth Congress. It was based on, and I'm just going to give you the title of this book, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I just want to give you a heads up. It was based on a book by the title of A Purpose Driven Life. Yes. Now, the issue with that book is this. Even though I will say, I'm going to say a positive note first. Even though I will say the point that the author is trying to make is that you are worth something. Your life is worth something. You have meaning in your life and you're not here by accident. That's the thing he's trying to communicate. Unfortunately, the way he's communicating it is based on what's called the Augustinian blueprint view or blueprint theology. And that idea is, Augustinian blueprint theology is, is that everything that happens in this world is God's will. Everything. And the reason why this is so difficult is because of what happens to young ladies like this who are raped 
And then the conclusion they come to is, this is God's will. And this is what she was told by this Adventist pastor. And I said to her immediately, I said, listen, I said, I need to tell you something right now. I said, that sermon that you heard this morning is not biblically true. I said, it's not. I said, I know that you, have to, you think you have to believe, but you don't. I said, let me tell you what the Bible actually teaches about this. And we went to Luke chapter 11, and we went through a number of Bible verses. You know, in Luke chapter 11, uh, we talked about that already, but in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says that we should pray, Father, deliver us from evil. <laughs> I said, what happened to you is evil. I said, if God, if that's God's will, it would be such a contradiction for us to be saying to God, God, deliver us from your will. If evil is God's will, we're praying for God to deliver us from His will. That doesn't make sense. And I'm telling you what, as we started moving through these Bible texts together, her eye, she was crying, she was weeping. It was all coming out, but all of a sudden, her face got a smile on it. And you could see light come into her eyes, and you could see the, the darkness moving away, because she was shrouded in darkness. You could see her face lift up, and you could see her countenance change. And you saw hope and light come into her eyes. Now, I, in that moment, I knew this is the reason why I'm in Africa right now. Amen. Yeah, I'm here for 500 young people. I'm here to preach sermons. But this person right here is the reason why I got on that plane. That's the reason why my plane took off and no other plane took off. That's the reason why I wasn't stranded with 40,000 people in London Heathrow Airport. I'm here. This is, a prov this is providence. And I told her that. I said, do you know how I got here? Do you know what happened to me to get here? I said, this is a miracle that I'm here. And this is God is sending me for you. And God sent Moses for his people. And God is sending you for them. The world is groaning. And they don't know what to do with this pain and this anguish and this heartache. They don't know what to do with it. And God is sending us to people. He wants us to communicate to people. Sometimes, you know, we're all about the theological truths. The seventh day is the Sabbath day. And when you die, this is what happens. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's start where it hurts. People need a, a, a picture of God first. Who is this God? What is He like? And that's why in the New Testament, all the groanings belong to God. In John eleven thirty eight, 38, Jesus groans. In, in Acts 7, 34, 35, it's talking about how God saw the groanings of His people. And in Romans chapter 8, and verse 26, the Holy Spirit groans. This is the heart of God that's being pictured. And God looked at this young lady who went through years of just stuffing the pain that she was experiencing, thinking that God, it was God's will that this happened to her, who was suicidal time after time after time. This, this young lady who was suffering with migraine headache, headaches and couldn't talk to anybody about this. And God said, I'm going to send somebody from thousands of miles away to communicate to her who I really am what's really going on and what really happened to her in her life. There are times when God's will is stifled. I want you to look in Daniel chapter 10 because this gives us a powerful picture of this conflict between good and evil. It's a significant conflict. It's a powerful conflict. It's taking place right now. If our eyes could be opened, we would see angels, good and evil, contending for our allegiance, fighting for us, over us. If our eyes, our spiritual eyes could be opened. And there are a lot of people today who are in bondage. And those of us who struggle with this spiritual bondage, and God wants to deliver. He wants to set the captives free. In Daniel chapter 10, there's this conflict taking place, this spiritual war that is taking place. Daniel begins praying. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, he's praying and he's asking for help. In those days, verse 2, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I didn't eat any bread. I didn't eat any pleasant bread. That means I can't eat at Hannah's house. <laughs> for three whole weeks, he's just praying. And, and as the time goes by, he gets an answer. Now, notice what it says here. Daniel chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. And he said unto me, O Daniel... 
a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for I, unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, verse 12 of Daniel 10, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I'm come for your words. Our prayers are not only, always answered immediately, but they are always heard immediately. They are always heard immediately. This is a powerful example in the Bible of the reason why our prayers aren't always answered immediately. Daniel prayed, and it was 21 days before his prayer was answered. He was, it was heard immediately. It says right here, Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But, notice verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Who's the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Satan. Jesus called him the prince of this world. The king of Persia is one of the princes of this world, and Satan claims ownership to this world. And he's withstanding. He is resisting God's will on planet earth. That's what he's doing. See, Daniel, in the context of this, Daniel is praying to understand the prophecy that is pointing to the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and, and the reestablishment of his people and also is connected with the Messiah coming in 70 weeks, 70 prophetic weeks, 483 years, be anointed in 490 years. He's, he's trying to understand that prophecy and that prophecy is dependent on the decree and the goodwill of the princes of Persia. And so Satan is coming in and he's trying to hinder the outworking of God's plan, of God's will, of God's prophecy, of, of a prophetic history. Satan is trying to hinder what God has designed would happen to deliver us from evil and from sin, specifically connected to the Messiah. And as Satan tries to hinder this, Gabriel comes. And Gabriel is fighting this spiritual battle with the forces of evil for 21 days. And then who shows up? Michael shows up. The one who is like God. And when Michael shows up, Gabriel says, when Michael shows up, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, there's three of them. Michael's one of them. There's three chief princes. There's the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Michael. <laughs> the one who is like God. When Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So, when Michael shows up, the victory is won. We read it in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? It's won. And Satan trembles. He stands back. Friends, our victory, the victory of this church for our members and for our community is in prayer. It is on our knees. And there is nothing that Satan fears so much. He fears evangelism a little bit. He fears Bible studies. We're, we're doing all of that. But there is nothing that he fears so much that we would pray. That's the thing he fears more than anything else. And even when you can't pray, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will interpret. <laughs> If you don't feel like you can pray, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I feel like the words that are coming out of my mouth are just garbage. I'm just repeating the same old stuff, the same old stuff. So I just will get on my knees, and I will just be on my knees. And I'll just let God just communicate. The Holy Spirit communicate to God what it is that's on my heart. I'm just there in silence. I'm just there. God knows what's on my heart. God knows what my burden is. I, don't, I can't voice it. I don't know what to say. But I just feel this need. So I'm just on my knees. It's okay if you can't pray. If you, can't, if you, don't, know, if you don't know what words to say, that's okay. <laughs> just, just give the time to God. He'll interpret it. He'll, he'll communicate it. Don't ever think that you can't pray. We see the same picture in, this, in the New Testament. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul was wrestling with this. He was struggling with this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. 17 and 18. Paul is, is speaking here of his experiences in preaching and teaching and traveling. 
And he says in verse 17, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Do you know why Paul was, was taken from them in presence? The reason he was taken from them in presence is because when he was there preaching to them, the Jews came and they stirred up the people and they tried to kill Paul and he had to leave. That was the actual fact of what was taking place in this situation. But notice what Paul says in verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, again and again, but who's, who hindered us? Satan hindered us. See, there are things happening in this world. There are, there are situations and circumstances taking place in this world where people are being used by Satan to hinder God's will and God's plans. We should never attribute that to God's will. We've got to make a distinction because we are in a great controversy between good and evil. And there are things happening. There are afflictions. There are health issues. There are, there are people who are suffering because of decisions that individuals are making. Yeah, they're being influenced by Satan. They're being influenced. That's what we see in Job. How did Job's animals die? Did they all just fall over one day? No. The Sabians came and the Chaldeans came, right? People that were being influenced by Satan came and worked out Satan's will. That's not God's will. But we're in this great controversy and God has allowed for the freedom of individuals to choose between Him and the forces of darkness. And when people choose the forces of darkness, God doesn't just zap them out. Because those people could possibly repent and turn. And so God allows time for this to be worked out. And through that process, we are called to be soldiers for Christ and to endure bravely so that we could actually be channels through which those people turn like Paul did, who was persecuting the church of God. But now, much to Stephen's surprise, is going to be in heaven. <laughs> Hanging out with Stephen, talking about the good old days and the bad old days. Job realized this in time. And he began to pray, not just for his kids, but also for his miserable comforter friends. And God restored everything to Job. He gave him twice what he had before. And he even gave him twice the kids. Well, really not in a literal sense, because he only had ten more children. But we know, as we read about the story of Job, that those ten children were in earnest of the ten that he lost. In other words, God was saying, I'm going to give you twice, 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 twice the camels, twice the oxen, twice the sheep, and ten more children, seven sons and three daughters, just like you had, because I want you to know that all this double and these single digits of your kids, the ten instead of the twenty, is a message from me that your kids are safe. Your prayers were answered. Job's friends, you know, were the ones who said, oh, God killed them because they were sinning. God said in the end, you guys haven't spoken that which is right like my servant Job has. Job was saying, no, no, God isn't like that. God is, I don't understand what God is, is doing here. I don't understand what's happening, but God is not like that. And he's not. He is absolutely not like that. So don't give up. Don't faint. Moms, it's really important. Adventist Home, page 266. The power of a mother's prayers cannot be too highly estimated. She who kneels beside her son and daughter through the vicissitudes of childhood, through the perils of youth, will never know until the judgment, the influence of her prayers upon the life of her little ones. You're just not going to know. So just keep praying, just keep praying, just keep praying for your kids, because God will deliver them. If she connected by faith and with the Son of God, if she is connected by faith with the Son of God, the mother's tender hand may hold back her son from the power of temptation, may restrain her daughter from indulging in sin. When passion is warring for the mastery, the power of love, the restraining, earnest, determined influence of the mother may balance the soul on the side of right. You're never going to know until the judgment the influence of your prayers. The influence of your prayers. There's a book by a pastor by the name of Jim Cimbala, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. It's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Power. I don't always recommend books, but this one I do recommend. You will weep 
You will laugh. You will, it will change your life, your prayer life. This book will. Fresh Wind, Fresh Power. And in it, he talks about the experience of his daughter who rebelled. This was a pastor who God blessed. And what God told him, he was in this church in New York that was dilapidated. The building was dilapidated. There were 17 members. They couldn't pay the bills. He had a nervous breakdown and he left for Florida on a fishing trip. And when he was on that fishing trip, God told him, this is what I want you to do. And he got so excited. He went back to his church and he said, God has spoken to me and God has told me what we need to do. And the church member was like, what? And he said, we need to pray. That's what we need to do. We need to pray. Huh? We do pray. No, we need to pray. And they, they set up a 24-7 prayer time. They would pray 24-7, 24-7. Always someone praying in that church. And as time went on, they had to get a new building. Thousands of people, druggies, prostitutes, you name it, off the streets of New York, came to that church and were saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. But his daughter rebelled and she left. She, she just left. And she went into the wickedest, darkest stuff. And one day, they could see the burden on the pastor's heart. And the whole congregation got on their knees. And they just started praying for the daughter. Just praying for her. And they wouldn't stop. They just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And shortly after that, the daughter came back to the house. She knocked on the door. She came into the home. And of course, the, the father was so happy, so overjoyed to see her. And she said, no, Dad, no. I just, want you to, I just want to know one thing. Who's been praying for me? Who's been praying for me? Her life was completely transformed, and she knew it was the power of prayer. Sometimes we don't think we can pray because our thoughts are evil. Who am I to pray? I'm not a good person. Well, none of us are good. No, not one. There's none righteous. There's no one that's seeking after God. God is calling not the righteous, but the sinners. Do not, I'm quoting now, Signs of the Times, November 18, 1903, and we'll close with this thought. Do not, because your thoughts are evil, cease to pray. Do not, because your thoughts are evil, cease to pray. If we could in our own wisdom and strength pray aright, we could also live aright and would need no atoning sacrifice. But imperfection is upon all humanity. Educate and train the mind that you may in simplicity tell the Lord what you need. As you offer your petitions to God, seeking for forgiveness for sin, a purer and holier atmosphere will surround your soul. Just pray. Just pray. Don't let Satan tell you that you're evil, that you're wicked, and therefore you can't pray. Don't listen to him. Just pray. Give it to God. And if you can't utter the words, that's okay. The Holy Spirit will utter the words. He'll read your heart. He knows what you're experiencing. It's time. Isn't it? Don't you think? It's time. So, we're going to do something a little different this morning. At least I am. Normally, after I close with prayer, I move through to the back of the church, and I stand at the door, and I greet you, and you tell me what a great sermon I gave, and I thank you. And we go through that whole process. And I think that is a tradition. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible. I don't know that it's based in Scripture or anything like that. I, I liked it. I have liked it because it gives me an opportunity to know you. But as you know, I have started pastor's hours. It was in the announcements. If, for those of you who didn't get the announcements, I've started pastor's hours. I'm going to be here on Sundays when I'm here at the office from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. And I'd love to meet with you and get to know you that way. And if I can't, if you can't come to the church, and I'm doing that on Sundays because I know a lot of you work through the week and I can't come to your home during that time or whatever and you're busy, I also am very happy to come to your home and visit with you. I would love to get to know you personally and not just on the way out of church. So I'm going to scrap that tradition because I really feel that when we talk about the Bible, when we talk about these truths, we need to, to move on them. We need to act on them. 
I also believe that even if I'm not talking about prayer, there are going to be weeks and Sabbaths when some of you are really hurting and you need not to tell the pastor you had a good sermon or for the pastor to say, it's good to see you, but you just need to pray. You just need someone to pray with. So starting today, I'm after the sermon, I'm just going to go sit down right over here and I'm going to be available for prayer if anyone just wants to pray. You don't have to have a major catastrophe happening in your life, but maybe you just feel impressed that you have something you'd like to pray for. And I'm hoping that in time, there'll be so many of us that are just wanting to pray that there'll be an elder in this row, maybe another elder in that row, and we can facilitate all the prayers. Today, I'm going to be the only one. Two of our elders are actually gone today, John and... Who's that other guy again? Tom. Lance is here. Lance is here, um, and he's going to... I've asked him if he would greet you at the door. And then, um, but in time, if there's, you know, we can't handle all the prayer requests, or there's a lot of you, and we don't want to wait a lot of time, you know, have you waiting a lot of time, um, just a few minutes together with each one of you to pray, um, we'll try to facilitate more prayer time. But I really feel that this is something God, it's something God has impressed upon my heart. I really think that it can be a, bur- a blessing to, to give those burdens to the Lord right now, today on the Sabbath, not just to leave the church and think, oh, you know, great sermon, but but to actually be able to practice um, giving our burdens to God in prayer. So let's pray together as a family, and then we can break up. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you again this morning for my church family here in Cascade, for, for how you have brought them together, and for the fact that in spite of the intense evil and pain that they've experienced, young and old, male and female, that you have guided them and and strengthened them and encouraged them and that they're still here. They're still here gathering to worship you and, and looking to you and hoping for something better. And we know that 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 something better is going to be realized by and by. But we also want some of it now. You promise to give us the peace, to give us hope, to give us joy, to give us courage, to sustain us. And we can't go on by ourselves dealing with all this pain and suffering and loss. And so this morning I'm giving you our hearts collectively and I'm just asking and praying and and believing that the burdens that we carry, the evil that we've experienced, that all of it can be overruled for good. We know that you're not in the business of bringing evil, but you overrule evil with good. And we know that every one of us is created with a purpose. No matter how we came into this planet, into this life, you have a purpose for us that you can overrule evil with good. That you can bring good out of all this pain and sin and suffering. And that you have dedicated your son to the salvation of each one of us individually. There's not a person here that's been left out of that, but there's not a person on planet Earth who's been left out. And I thank you for this, Father. And I I just pray this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ, that if there is a burden that individuals want to share, to pray together, that you'll put that on their hearts and that you'll bless.